All right, so now we're going to get into Galatians chapter 3, and uh, this is blessing me. I mean, not because I, I'm doing it, but just the getting into the Word of God is just, wow. I mean, just amazing when you get into the Word of God, the life that comes from it. So we're going to start here in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Faith is what brings righteousness. And now we'll start with verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? See, here, here's Paul. He's coming to them, and Paul loves the Galatians. In fact, in chapter 4, he calls them my little children. And Paul comes back, and he's like, what is going on? When I came, we had a revival. When I came, the Spirit was moving. When I came, the, the Holy Spirit was doing signs, wonders, miracles. People were getting saved. All these great things were happening. Galatians, you're being foolish. You're actually under a witchcraft curse. Not from a witch doctor. Not from someone creating some kind of potion or spell. You're under a witchcraft curse. You are bewitched by the Judaizers. They're false teaching saying that you must be justified not only by faith in Jesus Christ, but by the works of the law. You are under a curse. They have put you in a spell. Your mind is now confused. Your mind is washed over with a cloud of confusion. You can't even think straight anymore. Come on, you've lost your mind. That's basically my paraphrase of this verse. Verse 2, here's what Paul's saying to them. The only thing I want to find out from you is, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? If you can answer this one question, you can solve the entire problem. When I came to you, you did, I did not preach the law to you and the Holy Spirit was poured out. I preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. You put your faith in him. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. And what happened? The Holy Spirit began to move. So let me then ask you then, did you receive the Holy Spirit by working, by doing works of the law, by trying to be justified, by getting circumcised, by trying to keep the feast and the Sabbath and all those other commandments? Did you, did you get right with God doing any of that? Did you receive the Spirit by doing any of that, by the works of the law? Or did you do it by the hearing with faith? You heard the gospel. You responded in faith. You believed what Jesus Christ accomplished for you on the cross. And therefore, when you did, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon you with signs and wonders and miracles. And the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you as life. They had a good beginning. Verse 3, are you so foolish I love Paul. He's not mincing words with his children. Are you foolish? What are you thinking? What are you thinking, Galatians? You began by the Spirit, and your beginning was awesome. You began by the Spirit of God, and now you're trying to be perfected by the flesh. You're trying to be perfected by your obedience. You're trying to be perfected by keeping the Sabbath. You're trying to be perfected by keeping the feast. You're trying to be perfected by keeping the moral law. You're trying to be perfected by getting circumcised. You're, you, you know, are you so foolish? The Holy Spirit is the end goal of the law. The Messiah is the end goal of the law. Him in you, the Spirit of God in you, and Him living is the end goal of it all. And you began this way, and you're now stopping to come under the works of the law. Come on. makes me feel better sometimes as a preacher when I call out people, you know. Um, Paul called them foolish, bewitched. Did you suffer so many things in vain? Verse 4, if indeed it was in vain. Verse 5, so then he, so then does he who provides you with the Spirit and work miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? See, the Judaizers came to them after Paul had a move of the Holy Spirit. And they said, you've got to, if you want to be right with God, you've got to keep all 613 commandments. And they brought the Galatians under a, under a curse, under confusion. They bewitched them. And Paul's saying, okay, think about this, guys. I was with you. The Spirit of God moved. 
not in response to what you did, but because of you receiving what Jesus did by faith. You received what Jesus did for you on the cross by faith. Then the Holy Spirit began to move. Why, if you began this way, are you trying to now be perfected by the works of the law? No. That's not the way you're to live. You're to live by the same way you began. If you, be, if you were justified by faith, if you were justified by grace, if you were justified by the Spirit of God, then you are to be sanctified. You are to be holy. You are to live by the life of God through, by grace through faith, not by the works of the law, not by trying to do things for God. See, how many of us, uh, Watchman Nee talks about this in his book, The Spiritual Man. I, he goes through, I don't know, a good number, I don't know how many, maybe a chapter on this, and it is convicting of how often we, the flesh and the pride of the flesh and the soul gets mixed in. We come to this place in God where we are just, we're saved, we're born again, and it's only God that has done it by our faith, by and our, our, us receiving it by faith. We then get into trying to do for God, do something for God, do something for Him to please Him. And, and you know, Watchman, he just hammers it. It's an incredible part of his book, The Spiritual Man, hammers it just, you know, page after page. You began by the Spirit. You began by the Spirit. Why are you trying to be perfected by the flesh, by, by what you do for God? It is not by the works of the law. It is by hearing with faith. John Stott, in his commentary on Galatians, talking about this, says something, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but says something like this, the law requires human achievement. The gospel depends upon Christ's achievement. The law makes demands and bids us to obey. The gospel makes promises and bids us to believe. That's so good. The law is all about us, and I think this is where I, I put my own words here. The law is all about us gritting our teeth, striving to please God by our obedience. The gospel is all about Christ and his spirit coming to dwell within us and him living his life in us and through us, giving us the power to obey. It's beautiful. God, the gospel is good news. I mean, you look on... The news today and all that's going on in the world, our world is on fire. Our world is in utter chaos. I'm not sure it's going to get much better until the Lord returns, but I want to tell you there is good news. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, there is no better news than this, that his, he came to justify you and make you righteous and put his life in you and give you the power to obey by him living in you. Verse 6, even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith, who are of faith, who are the sons of Abraham. And again, we're being introduced here in Galatians, one little, one, couple little sentences. Again, Paul will unlock this entire concept in Romans chapter 4. I mean, he goes into incredible detail in Romans chapter 4, but here in Galatians, he merely introduces us to this. But it is one of his favorite teachings of justification by faith is to pick Abraham. Abraham being the example. Abraham, here's what Abraham did. Before there was even any law, Abraham by faith believed God. Believed God's word. Believed God's promise. And what, what God did is he imputed his righteousness to Abraham. In fact, the Greek word here, reckoned, is such an important word. I would highly recommend you go look and study if you want to go deeper. What that word reckoned means in verse 6, this word reckoned is a deep, deep Greek word, but I'll just make it simple. It means imputed. And, and so that's not really, you know, we're, none of us are really legal scholars or anything like that, but it's a really a legal word. 
So what it basically means is that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, apart from any works, apart from anything you do, apart from your past or your future or your current condition, when you say, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, God imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ, making you legally righteous in his eyes. So think about it like this. There's a 16-year-old girl, and she gets her driver's license. She goes, and she goes, you know, 30 miles over the speed limit. I'm sure no 16-year-olds do that, but just suppose they actually did. So 16 miles over the speed limit, she gets pulled over by a cop. The cop gives her a ticket. Now the insurance company comes to her parents and says, you went 30 miles over the speed limit. Your insurance is going up. And the parents go, wait, we didn't do that. Why are, you, why are you causing us to, our insurance to go up? Why are you putting this into our account? See, what happened was, is the 16-year-old girl is under the insurance of her, their, her parents, and the insurance company takes her offense and imputes it to her parents, reckoning them as if they had committed the, the offense, broke the law, therefore their insurance goes up. That's what impute is like. Jesus Christ is righteous. Jesus Christ is holy. When we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, God the Father takes his righteousness and he imputes it to us, reckoning us legally righteous in his eyes. Isn't that incredible? That is an imputed righteousness. Oh, the gift of imputed righteousness. Now, that's different than imparted righteousness. Imparted righteousness, which is also true when we are born again, when our spirit becomes righteous by the indwelling Holy Spirit. We're not talking about that here. But imparted is when the Spirit of God himself comes inside of us and actually puts real experiential righteousness into us so that a part of our being, our spirit, is made righteous just like Jesus. Imputed means what is true of someone is reckoned and put into our account so that now God looks at us, though he sees our sin, he sees us also through Christ, and he reckons us righteous legally. Powerful truth. So here, here's what we've got so far in the born-again experience. Is we have our legal position. Our legal position in the eyes of God is one of being justified, declared righteous. Our legal position in the eyes of God is having the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to our account. Not only, and Paul will unpack this in other, his other epistles, not, doesn't really get into it much here, but in, in Galatians, but in his other epistles, I'm thinking of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, Paul says, your new man, your spirit, I'm going to paraphrase it, your spirit is righteous, your spirit is holy, your spirit is like Jesus Christ. So here is the condition of those who are in Christ. We are legally righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are legally declared righteous because of what he did for us on the cross. And one-third of us, if we're spirit, soul, and body, one-third of us is actually righteous because the Spirit of God has come to dwell within us and he has imparted into our spirit the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are legally righteous, and one-third of you is actually experientially righteous. And so then the, the, the majority of our life now is, the, is God doing a work in our heart and our soul and our body to conform those into the image of his Son. And so Paul is making this statement. Paul is making this point. Um, and he goes on and he says in verse 7, he says, I want you to know, I want you to know it is those who are of the faith of Abraham, those who are of faith, those who have the faith of their father Abraham, Jew or Gentile, who are the sons of Abraham. 
And I'm sure that didn't go down. I'm sure the Galatians loved it, but the Judaizers, if they would have heard that statement, that would have gone down terrible for them. See, here's what we got to talk about here. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. When the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, he said to him, I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And I will take your seed and multiply it as the sand which is on the seashore. So God was cutting a covenant with Abraham, and he says, Look up, Abraham. The stars you see in the heavens, those are going to be like your descendants. The sand you see on the seashore, those are like your descendants. And a lot of scholars, and I, I, believe, this is, I, I believe this is accurate, when, it, when, it, when God was pointing the stars in the heaven, he was talking about Abraham's spiritual sons and daughters. And when God was looking on the, the seashore, the sand, he was talking about his natural, physical sons and daughters, the Jewish people. And so Abraham has a multitude of descendants, both natural and spiritual. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying those who are of the faith in Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, are Abraham's spiritual descendants. They are Abraham, they are the stars in heaven. They are the ones, they are the sons of Abraham, spiritually speaking. Um, and so in making this statement, I want to make a very careful point, is that we've got to be aware of two types of replacement theology. One type of replacement theology is, and this has been uh, prevalent for many years of history, church history, is, that the, is the teaching that says the church has replaced Israel in God's prophetic plans. You know, the promises spoken in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel were not made to, they were not made to, or they were made to Israel. Israel failed. Now the church has been given those promises. That is a false teaching. God's word, God's promises that were spoken to Israel were not spoken to the church, and they will be fulfilled in the Jewish, for the Jewish people and in the nation of Israel. Now, most of these, just to be honest with you, most of these are not going to be fulfilled until Jesus Christ comes back and rules and reigns from Jerusalem for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 6. So those promises are going to be fulfilled, but only in the person of Jesus Christ. But they will be literally fulfilled for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. The church has not replaced Israel. Now, the second form of replacement theology is, the, is, is what I, when, you, when you get into the teaching on Israel, what I have found is that a lot of people, they, they get into the teaching on Israel, and then they basically violate everything Paul has talked about in the book of Galatians. They want to actually move you, and, the, and a lot of the messianic movement want to move you and bring you back under the law. And so the second form of replacement theology we have to be aware of is we have to be aware of the Jews replacing Jesus Christ and his people. See, here, here, here's where it becomes very evident. The Jewish people who are not in Christ, according to Paul, were called enemies of the gospel. I mean, the perfect example was the Judaizers who came to Galatia. They were Jewish men. They were Jewish men. They were enemies of the gospel. They were trying to, you know, they were trying to say it's not Jesus Christ in the church. It's still the law of Moses. So we've got to be aware that that here's what we got to understand is Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 49. He is called Israel. The Messiah is called Israel, and we're going to see this in a minute. That he is the one that God made his promises to, not Isaac. Now, Isaac was a, was, a, was a step there or was a short-term solution there, but Jesus Christ was the seed that God made the promise to. Jesus Christ is Israel. Jesus Christ is the rich root of the olive tree. All of Israel's promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ, not in the Jewish people, but he is a Jewish man. So, you know, for, and then so Paul describes this all in Romans chapter 9 through 11 is that basically the Messiah is the rich root of the olive tree. The Jews, like Paul and all the apostles that are grafted into Jesus Christ, are partakers of the rich root of the olive tree. And the Gentiles, like a lot of us, who are grafted in 
uh, unnaturally, is what Paul says, grafted it unnaturally to the, to the olive tree, they also are partakers of Israel's, or of the, of the promises of the new covenant. So that is, there's a ton more that could be said about that, and I'm probably going to say some more later, but that's what I'm going to say for right now. Okay, verse 8, the, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify, justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. I love this. This is so beautiful. Paul is telling us when God told Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, be blessed in you. See, the blessing of Abraham, the blessings of Abraham are far greater than a piece of land in the Middle East. The blessings of Abraham are far greater than being healthy, wealthy, and wise. See, what Paul is saying here is the blessings God promised Abraham are the gospel of Jesus Christ, the seed, the Messiah, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the blessing of Abraham. That's the ultimate blessing of Abraham is the gospel, the Messiah, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so, verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Paul's telling the Galatians, he's saying, listen, if you really insist on becoming, if you insist on going back under the law, if you insist upon getting back to the works of the law, let me just warn you real quick. If you do that, you are under a curse. And if you want to find out about that, go read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 29. They, there are some terrible things that are spoken. And these are curses that don't come from the devil. They come from God. That's, you know, if you want to get under, back under the law, beware, I'm telling you. You can keep all 600, you can keep 612 commandments. But if you break down and go to Bucky's Barbecue and have a pulled pork sandwich and a moment of weakness, you are under the law. Therefore, you would come under a curse of poverty, sickness, you know, mental illness, oppression, all that's described in, in Deuteronomy 28 to 29. Paul's saying, beware, Galatians, you don't understand. I'm, 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 I, you know, I, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees, basically. I am blameless when it comes to the law. I know the law. I'm telling you, if you break one commandment, you will be cursed, not by the devil, but by God himself. Whoever is under the works of the law are under a curse. And that curse is described in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Verse 11, Now no one is justified by the law before God is evident. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man will live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them will live by them. What Paul is saying basically is, is that no person in history can ever keep every requirement of God externally and internally because we have a nature inherited from Adam, our forefather, that through his sin, his, his sinful nature was imparted into our DNA. We can never be righteous, even if we were to obey all 16, 613 commandments, we would never be righteous internally. Paul's telling us here, the law is not of faith. And he quotes in here Habakkuk 2.4, and and which says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. Faith righteousness. That's, that's where faith, uh, faith results in righteousness. See, the, the lifestyle we live is by faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith. The hearing with faith, the hearing with faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
Just as Abraham, the father of faith, he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. If we are going to live in a righteous place before God, it is by faith, it is not by the works of the law. Now he goes down, verse 13, and he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed it is everyone who hangs on the tree. What an incredible promise. What incredibly good news. Jesus Christ has delivered you from the curse of the law. Those terrible, terrible promises made of curses in Deuteronomy 28 through 29 of you know, physical ailments and mental ailments and oppression and poverty and enemies invading you and a messed up family life and all that stuff that God sends for breaking his commandments. What, what Paul's saying is Jesus Christ, when he hung on the cross, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. The curses of the law were placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. And so now you are delivered from the curse of the law. Praise God. Praise God that we, God no longer, if we, let's say we just, you know, we're, we're hungry and we go eat some shrimp. God does no longer now go and put Curses of sickness on us for doing that. I love seafood, so I thank God for that. And I love barbecue, so I thank God for that. He doesn't do that anymore. If we, he doesn't place the curses of Deuteronomy 28 through 29 on us if we fail to keep his commandments. That is good news. God does not curse us in that way. That's good news. However... Some have taken this to an unbiblical extreme and teach that God no longer judges people, right? So God no longer curses us if we don't meticulously keep all of the commandments, but they now say God never judges people like you, you know, like he never judges people. So the question I want to ask is, what then is the difference between God's curses, the curse of the law, and God's judgment? See, when I, when I read Scripture in the New Testament, New Testament Scripture, it's clear God still judges His people. Judge, Peter said, let judgment begin in the house of God. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 talks all about God's judgment. Well, I thought we were set free from the curse of the law. I didn't think God put on us sickness or poverty or any of those curses. So you're saying now God still judges? I'm confused, okay? So what then is the difference between the curse of the law and God's judgments? Here, and I've got it in the notes. I'm, I'm, you could go into a long teaching about this, so I'm just going to keep it really, really, really simple just for the sake of time. The curse of the law was God's retribution for violating the covenant. God's judgment is fatherly discipline for prolonged sin and disobedience. The curse of the law was unredemptive punishment. That's, that's big right there. The curse of the law was unredemptive punishment. God's judgment is redemptive child training. The curse of the law made those who violated his commandments God's enemy. Well, when we are living in disobedience and not, and not obeying the Lord, we remain God's child, but he trains us through correction to become his mature son. So here, just to summarize, God no longer places us, places curses on us for disobeying his commandments. God no longer releases sickness, poverty, oppression, and barrenness if we fail to meticulously obey his commandments. But he does, like Hebrews 12 talks about, he does bring correction, strong correction, that is a father correcting his child, bringing us into a place of Christ-like maturity. Now, 
There is so much more I could say about that. In fact, I probably at some point need to do more of a teaching, and I plan to do more of an in-depth teaching on that because there is so much confusion in the body of Christ about being set free from the curses of the law and God's judgment. And so what I've seen is you got really two camps, and, I, and there's one camp over here that says God never, ever does anything anything. To correct his children, God never does anything like that because we're set free from the curse. In this other camp, every single bad thing that happens is, is God sending that on you. And so there's a balance in here that we are definitely redeemed from the curse of the law, but God the Father, as a loving Father, disciplines us, corrects us, scourges us so that we might come into full Christ-like maturity. So I'm not going to spend any more time about that, I'm sure, you might have some more questions about that, but I hope to, in another teaching, go into a lot more detail about that. Verse 14. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so, there's many blessings of Abraham. There's the blessing of the Middle East, the plot of land in the Middle East. There's the blessings of prosperity and health and healing and, and things like that. All kinds of blessings the Jewish people lived in for many years. But by and far, the greatest blessing of Abraham is the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the ultimate blessing of Abraham. Far greater than a piece of land, far greater than health and wealth and influence. Now we look at uh, verse, verse 15, the intent of the law. And so Paul says, brethren, I speak in human terms. I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant. Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Verse 16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. I love this. This is awesome. He's basically saying, look, guys, when Abraham made the covenant, or when God made the covenant with Abraham, the promise was not spoken to Isaac. Now, I know Isaac was a short-term solution, but the ultimate thing God was looking for was to Christ, to the Messiah. He is the one that the promises were made to, not seeds in the plural, not ultimately to Isaac. God was making his covenant promises to Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Israel. G uh, Isaiah 49 verse 3, Jesus Christ is Israel. Jesus Christ is the Jewish man to whom God made all the promises in the prophets. Every one of those promises that the prophets made ultimately would be fulfilled in Israel are going to be fulfilled only because of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He is Israel. He is the one to whom the promises were made and will be all fulfilled. The promises were not made to Isaac. They were made to Christ. Paul is bringing us on to Revelation to say when God cut covenant with Abraham, he was looking to Messiah. He was looking to Jesus Christ. Verse 17, what I am saying is this, the law which came about 430 years later, it does not invalidate a covenant that God previously made so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And so Paul is basically telling the Galatians, hey, look, they, you guys are wanting to come under the law. It came 430 years later after the covenant. Why would you want to go back to something that was, why would you want to go to something that is so outdated? The, the covenant that God made with Abraham was looking to the gospel why would you want to go to something else? And he's just like trying to argue with him. Don't, don't go back under the law. Verse 19. I like this. Is a, this is such a great question. Why the law then? You know, why the law? I mean, why do we even need the law if the, we see the covenant that God made with Abraham and all those things? Why do we even need the law? And Paul says, it was added because of transgressions. 
It was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. And I, I, you can really quickly glance over this and miss, oh, the incredible revelation here. Paul's telling us the law came until the Messiah. Let me explain that. So I, I did a teaching recently on called The Days of Noah, where I looked at the days of Noah, and I tied it back to Genesis 3.15, and that Genesis 3.15 prophecy says that, it, actually, let me, let me just uh, read it here, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head, and you will bruise him on the hill. The ancients, going all the way back to Adam, preserved that prophecy. They said that that prophecy, the first prophecy in Scripture, drove them, motivated them, caused them to want to live righteous. And so you can read in Genesis chapter 5 the lineage of Seth. It's the righteous lineage. Genesis 6 calls that lineage the sons of God because they are trying to preserve that Genesis 3.15 prophecy because they, they want to see the Messiah come forth. Well, then... And in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, the lineage of Seth, begin to mix and intermingle with the sons of Cain. And I, I, in my teaching, I go into great depth in that, and I'll be releasing future teaching about that as well. It um, goes into a lot more detail. But so, suddenly, or, all of a, or over time, compromise begins to creep into the lineage of Seth so that now in Seth. In his lineage, there is only one person, probably out of millions of people. Out of millions of people in the line of Seth, there is only one person God finds who is righteous, and that's Noah. See, what's at stake here is the Messiah and God's ultimate intention. Genesis 3.15 prophecy, all that God wanted to bring forth um, into the earth. There's only one man now that can make that happen. It's Noah. That's, that's pretty scary. And so that's one of the reasons, that's probably the, the main reason why God destroyed the entire earth. Every wiped out animals and, and men and women all over the world. He destroyed, you know, however many there was, millions, billions of people, we don't know exactly. He destroyed them because at stake was the Genesis 3.15 prophecy. If Noah is compromised, if Noah goes, there's no one left. Genesis 3.15 cannot be fulfilled. The Messiah cannot be fulfilled. And so now Paul is bringing us back, and Paul says, the law was given. I, I believe the Lord even looked at the days of Noah and said, you know, God's nature is not to be an, a God of judgment. And he looked at the days of Noah and said, I don't ever want to do that again. Now, he will in the book of Revelation. We know that. But I, that my heart isn't to bring destruction, and my heart isn't to bring judgment. So I am going to create a very intricate, I'm going to detail an intricate detail what my standards of righteousness are because I want to preserve a remnant that can give birth to the Messiah. That's why the law was given. That's exactly what Paul is saying here in verse 19. Why the law then? It was given until the seed would come to whom the promises had been made. See, think about this. The Jewish people with their, their strict dietary regulations, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. That created this, this separation, and I believe it was God's intention to create that separation so that the, the Jewish people set apart by God, set apart for obedience, set apart for righteousness, ultimately set apart and sanctified to bring forth the Messiah. God wanted to set them apart so they would not be defiled. See, God was looking to that promise. And so, so what happened was the Jewish people would try to eat with the Gentiles, and it was just, you know, it was just impossible to do because they, their, their law required such stringent requirements that Jewish people were like, we can't even go there because we'll get defiled by the food, we'll break the law. And so it created, it, by the Lord, a natural separation from the Jewish people, separating them from the Gentile world, all for the purpose of bringing forth Messiah Jesus Christ. That's why the law was given. There's other reasons to show sin, to show righteousness, things like that. I believe the ultimate purpose of the law was to keep Israel sanctified and set apart 
so that he would never come into a situation like he did in the days of Noah when there was one man left. Probably say a lot more about that as well. Verse 20. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture, talking about the law, has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Paul, I just want to highlight here something Paul says. The external commandments contained in the law have no inherent power to impart life. They have no power to impart righteousness inwardly. They just merely tell you, do this, do that. Do this, do that. They have no power in and of themselves to produce life. And God, or Paul is unveiling to us, the ultimate intention of God was to send his son as the tree of life, to come as the tree of life, who would then be the life that we live by. The external commandments cannot impart life. Only Jesus Christ, through his spirit, can impart life. See, the law has no power to give you the ability to obey. It only tells you what's right and wrong. Only the indwelling Holy Spirit can do that. And so just to bring this to a close, Paul is basically saying that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a son of Abraham, a spiritual son of Abraham. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. You are blessed with Abraham, the believer. You receive the ultimate blessing of Abraham, which is the indwelling Holy Spirit. You now, are, have, a, now have an impartation of life that you can live by. And, and what incredibly good news that is. And I think he would ask us, as he did the Galatians, do you want to live legalistically under the law, under external commandments where you always feel condemned and always struggling in the flesh to obey God? Or do you want to be set free from the shackles of legalism to begin living by the life of Jesus Christ inwardly in your spirit? Amen.